Okay, uh, I want to welcome you all to uh, Cedar Hill Cemetery. My name is Philip Franklin, and I'm, I'm the caretaker at this time of, of, this, uh, of what we know as the City of the Dead. Uh, in 1830 is whenever this, this uh, cemetery was established. Uh, in uh, 18, or 1946 is whenever this cemetery was actually surveyed. So it was uh, it was very difficult to uh, figure out where someone was at in the cemetery. Uh, in 1953, the parking lot y'all just come from, we, we known that as the Cantrell Edition. That's whenever that part of the cemetery was added to the, the older section of the cemetery here. The, in, in, in 1956, what I call the new part of the cemetery is, uh, is when you go up this hill and go to the left like you're going toward Dawson Road, that's, uh, that's, that was uh, established, a, a part of the cemetery was in 1956. Uh, in 1958, that big mausoleum that's behind you, they, uh, <clears throat> that's whenever that was started, in, in, but in 1960 is whenever it was dedicated. Uh, in 2000, in 2011, uh, the city decided to uh, put the cemetery in the 21st century, and, and was able to put us uh, on computer with the cemetery. Uh, we had this uh, cemetery re uh, remapped, resurveyed, and and now we're able to, uh, hopefully in the future, be able to. If John Doe is your family member, and and you ask where John Doe is, I'll be able to type in John Doe and I will be able to locate your family member and just like that. Uh, yeah. In 1966, James Coleman, which was the caretaker at that time, he estimated, estimated that uh, uh, there was 8,903 people buried at that time in 1966, December of 1966. Uh, we bear average uh, about 70 a year, 60 to 70 a year. So if you add all that up in 2014, it comes up to about probably 12,000 plus people that we have buried in the cemetery. Uh, we do have, uh, since we map, remapped us, uh, in uh, the cemetery, we're at, we know how many lots that we have available. Uh, <clears throat> there is actually eight, 18,000 553 places for, for people in the cemetery. So you'll always have, we, we should have, always have room. Uh, we have uh, <clears throat> a place's expansion if we need to. This is a 45 acre cemetery. Uh, we do have expansion to go bigger if we need to. Uh, this cemetery has doctors, lawyers, uh, governors. I don't know if you, all y'all ever been, been to the cemetery before. Uh, and we also have veterans, uh, lots of veterans. Uh, we have veterans from the Revolutionary War all the way to the Vietnam War. Uh, if you ever go on Memorial Day weekend up here, you'll see uh, hundreds of flags flying because the uh, uh, veterans, uh, American Legion and, and the VFW, they, they place flags. So if you're ever able to get up here in Memorial Day weekend, you see how many veterans we have. Something for Princeton to be very, very proud of. Because, uh, patriotic city. So uh, the, the loop around here is about a mile and a half. Uh, a mile and a half. The loop around here is about half mile. Uh, one little hill right here. Uh, and uh, uh, I appreciate your time and hopefully y'all learn a little bit about it. I'm Private Robert T. Davis and I served in Company I of the Kentucky 48th Mounted Infantry Division in the U.S. Army. You know, most people at Princeton don't realize the Civil War was around these parts. As a matter of fact, over 60 of my fellow soldiers died in Princeton, Kentucky alone. I was born in Smith County, Tennessee, and then later moved up to Kentucky to where I enlisted in June of 1863, and I died that same November. <coughs> I only had a short military career of five months. You know, although I was raised a farm boy, military records describe me as having a fair complexion six feet one inch tall and black eyes you know I was tall for my age the average Civil War soldier height was 5'7 to 5'8 
you know, but I guess it really doesn't matter how tall you are when they lay you down for the last time. You know, I appreciate having a marble tombstone. And so many of my fellow soldiers are still buried in unmarked graves. During Memorial Day, soldiers in the community put a flag on my grave. And I appreciate that more than they know. You all can move along to the next stop. Oh, why they love the least crew. But I'm sure you're here to hear about my outrage, my brutal outrage of a few days ago. Well, let me start by telling you, I'm Mrs. George Ratliff. My first name's Tila. My husband, George, is a cashier at the Princeton Bank. It's owned by the Ratliffs. But I want to tell you the story of two men, a Mr. Riggs and a Mr. Luttrell, who were accused of horse thieving. And there was no proof that they did this crime. And they were just about to be dismissed from all charges. But let me tell you what happened six days before. I was brutally outraged and chloroformed in my house. Two men ransacked my home while my husband was gone. Have you ever been chloroformed? It's so terrible. You wake up so sick. You wish you'd died. I can still feel that filthy rag on my face and those hands on me. But let me get back to my story. Mr. Riggs and Mr. Luttrell were just being dismissed from their case when my husband and his two brothers went into the courtroom with guns drawn and accused those men of being the one that ransacked our home. Well, they immediately tried to escape. Al Ratliff shot Mr. Luttrell as he was going out the door. My husband and William, his brother, shot Mr. Riggs and he fell a foot from the judge's bench, dead. Everybody thought it was terrible, swift vengeance, but justified, very justified. But that's not the end of the story. As the word began to spread, the man from Tennessee, whose horses they had stolen, they were horse thieves, came to town. Come to find out, those horses were stolen 150 miles from Princeton. And on the second day, they were only 40 miles from where they took them. It became immediately obvious that there's no way they could have done what they were shot for. So my husband and his brothers immediately gave themselves up and they were convicted of manslaughter. But, thank goodness, on the office of governor was Luke P. Blackburn, who was also known as Lenient Luke. He pardoned my husband and his brothers because of the circumstances involved. And to tell you, the bad thing is, I've been living with this for some time because I'm the one that identified them. I was positive, as was my help. So let my story be a lesson. Even with positive proof, don't jump to conclusions. The outcome might not be good. Who we are, you don't know who we are. Hush, Wanda. Hi, my name's Morel Cox, and this is my annoying little sister, Wanda. We are the daughters of C.W. Cox, an insurance agent here in Princeton. I had just graduated from Butler High School when Nell Baker poisoned us in 1934. Morel was so smart. She was on the academic team. As I was saying, I don't know why Daddy thought we needed a nurse. I've been taking care of Wanda since she was four years old. Mama had to go to the hospital at Western State Hospital for as long as I can remember. Morel says Nell thinks she's Daddy's girlfriend, but Daddy can't have a girlfriend. He's married to Mama. You were just so young. You just never liked Nell because she liked me best. She told me so. She even made me that pretty yellow dress. Wonder why they didn't bury me in that. Anyways, and yes, I was just so smart that I didn't realize what was happening to us until it was too late. When Wanda got sick, I tried to help take care of her, but I didn't feel well either. Then Wanda died, and I got really sick. I couldn't keep anything down that I ate. I sort of realized at the end what was happening to us, but I could never get the words to come out. I died seven days after Wanda. We heard that Nell was put on trial for Wanda's death, but it was never proven, so she got off. 
so we just stay here and watch people off the docks. It gets kind of lonely. But it's been nice having people here to notice us. Thanks for stopping by. <laughs> Hello. Hi there. Oh, uh, my name is uh, Charles Henry Webb. This is my wife, Cassandra Ford Webb. And we're here to entertain you tonight about our life experiences. Uh, I was born uh, near Lexington in Fayette County, Kentucky in uh, 1798. And uh, our story begins about 1822 when my brother John and I decided to take a flatboat from Louisville, Kentucky down the old high river, down the Mississippi, down to New Orleans to, uh, well, I don't know, vacation or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we left Louisville on this flat boat, and there were hogs on there and chickens and corn and whiskey and all that sort of thing. <laughs> and we made our way uh, pretty well down the old high until we got to Cabin Rock, Illinois. And there was this woman over there waving this white cloth in distress, seemed like so. The flat boat kind of went over there. And next thing we know, all these robbers came aboard, and they took the flat boat, and they took everything on the flat boat. And they told the passengers and everybody on there to more or less ski daddle, and they did. But they had a special treat for me. Uh, they blindfolded me, tied me up, put me on a little rowboat, and sent me down the Ohio River. So about oh, a couple, three miles down the river, I finally got myself untied. And I made my way to Smithland, Kentucky. And uh, once I got there, I told the people in Smithland about my, my problem. And I was really worried about my brother John, because the last time I saw him, I was being uh, tied up and blindfolded. So uh, they said, well, what you need to do is uh, go up here to uh, Tulu, Kentucky, uh, Ford's Ferry. It was then in eastern Livingston County, and talk to a man named uh, uh, James Ford. He has a 500-acre plantation up there, and evidently he has uh, ties with these robbers there at Cabin Rock. So, okay, so I went to Liberty Stable, got a horse, and made my way up to eastern Livingston County to Tulu in the, the Ford's Ferry area. And uh, I was almost to the Ford Plantation when my uh, horse uh, spooked, threw me off. I sprained my ankle when I hit the ground. And I was uh, there on the roadside rubbing my, rubbing my ankle. And uh, this young lady came along on horseback. And uh, she was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. I mean, just gorgeous. So we got to talking. And come to find out, uh, she was Cassandra Ford. She was the daughter of this James Ford, the man I was going to see to, to find out about my brother. <laughs> so she helped me on my horse, and we made our way to the plantation. And when I got there, they were very, they were very hospitable. And they bandaged my ankle, and they told me, well, you can't travel like this. You can just stay here for a while, kind of heal up a little bit. Okay, so they made a place in the front, uh, front parlor. And uh, I was seeing their healing up, but every day I noticed that these rather unsavory characters would come up the driveway to, to the house, and they would talk to James Ford for a while, maybe 20, 45 minutes, and they'd leave. Now, well, that's kind of unusual because they're pretty rough-looking customers. But, uh, and then I was there about, oh, four or five days. The last day I was there, a group of men came up to the front door, and I recognized one of these as one of the robbers that had robbed us over Cater Rock. And I thought, well, it's time for me to go because this looks kind of suspicious around here. I found out later that James Ford would, uh, he would fence all the goods that these uh, river pirates stole over there. He had agents in like Pittsburgh and St. Louis and New Orleans. He would take all their stolen goods, well they would give him their stolen goods. He would ship these stolen goods to these, these agents in all these cities and they would they would sell them and send him the proteins. He would take his cut and then give these uh, these robbers their, their money. So that was kind of how that worked. So I decided to leave there. I never forgot about the beautiful Cassandra Ford though, but I left there. Made my way back to Lexington. I enrolled uh, in medical school there at Transylvania and became a medical doctor in 1824. I decided to come back to Princeton to open a practice because I knew Cassandra Ford had, uh, she had ties here in Princeton. So I came back here to, to Princeton, opened my practice, but about once a week I would, uh, well, hitch my buggy to my horse and I would uh, make my way all the way up to Tulu to Ford's Ferry up there, uh, make house calls up there, and also, I dropped by and see the lovely Cassandra Ford. <laughs> Did you ever take a horse and buggy to Tulu? It's about 25 or 30 miles. <laughs> anyway, I was in love. But I must have done something right because in February 1826, we got married. And I brought her back to Princeton. And I built her a fine house, a fine brick house at the 310 North Harrison Street in Princeton. And we uh, set up housekeeping, started having a family. We had nine children, only five of which lived to adulthood to their 20s. Uh, the rest, of course, died young. So, uh, yeah, things were going pretty well. Now, every fall, I would close down my medical practice here in Princeton, and I would make my way up to Lexington to visit my mother. 
I take a horse and buggy to Smithson and then a steamboat up to uh, Louisville, then horse and buggy up to Lexington to visit Mom. And then uh, one year, in October of 1844, I decided to take my 10-year-old daughter, Cassandra. She was named after her mother, Cassandra. My 13-year-old uh, uh, brother-in-law, uh, James Ford, Jr., was going to take him with me, and also our 15-year-old daughter, uh, Frances, or Fanny, as we call her. So the four of us, we were going to go visit Grandma up in Lexington. So we made our way over to Smith and up the uh, uh, Ohio River to Louisville and then forced and buggy over to Lexington. And then uh, on our way back, uh, we came well, from Lexington to Louisville. At Louisville, we boarded a steamboat called the Lucy Walker. And uh, we were headed down the Ohio River from Louisville, down toward Smith and headed back home. And about five miles uh, south of uh, New Albany, Indiana, the boilers on the steamboat exploded. And I mean, it was a massive explosion. Uh, the steamboat just disintegrated, and they found body part, or they found debris on both sides. We were in the middle of the Ohio River, and they found debris on both sides of the river. Uh, my ten-year-old daughter Cassandra was killed instantly. My thirteen-year-old uh, brother-in-law, James Ford uh, Jr., he was killed instantly. Uh, I was burned so badly I died a week later on uh, October 30th, 1844. My uh, daughter uh, Frances, she survived with minor injuries. And uh, they brought her back to uh, they brought her back to Princeton, and she's buried right over there. So I was killed when I was 46 years of age. And I tried to make my way towards uh, where he was in New Albany, but I was I couldn't make the initial trip. I was with child, and our two youngest were home with me, and I didn't make it in time to see Charles before he passed. But we brought him back home and he was buried behind our house on North Harrison Street. Now my husband was a wonderful leader in this community, not only because he was a doctor, but also he was a leader in the Presbyterian Church and gave land for the Presbyterian Church to be built on um, behind our home. Is that correct, sir? So we were buried behind our home on North Harrison Street. First he was, and then later in 1963 when I died. And we stayed there until 1906 when the church and all the fixtures were sold, and we were brought up here. Our bodies were taken from our home and buried here in Cedar Hill Cemetery, where we've been ever since. And we're very happy to have guests, and please come back and see us again anytime. Hello, my Hello. name is Sarah Harpending, and I'm the third wife of Asbury Harpending. Asbury came from New York to Kentucky in the early 1800s. He came on a wagon train with many other families. On the wagon train, he married, met and married a young girl named Mary Ogden. Now, Mary's daddy was a circuit rider for the Methodist Church. And when they got here, he did that circuit, went from Methodist Church to Methodist Church, until they built the Ogden Methodist Church. And then he stayed and was the minister there. Mary and Asbury had five children. Now, Asbury was a good provider, and he needed to be. They had five kids. He was involved in land speculation. He owned land in Caldwell County, Christian County, and Lyon County. He had grist mills and sawmills. He was involved in banking. He was involved in farming. He was a good provider. He was also a believer in education. He was on the board of directors for Cumberland College in Princeton for many, many years. And then he thought about women, and he thought they needed an opportunity for education also. And he started, it was not, he started, <laughs> he started the Methodist Church, helped him, and they started the Masonic Academy for Women in Princeton. It was a 200-bed boarding school. It was located there beside the Ogden Methodist Church, where that playground, that Sarah Smith playground is now, it was located right there. And it gave girls an opportunity to get an education and to do well. Things were good, but then after 25 years of marriage, Mary died. And Asbury was alone. About two years later, he married again. He married Nancy Ann Clark. And they had two children, a son and a daughter. Nancy Ann decided she wanted to go on vacation. So she went. She went to St. Louis. 
The bad thing was there was a cholera outbreak in St. Louis. And Nancy Ann died of cholera after 19 years of marriage. So Asbury was alone again with two children. And those children were 12 and 15. Soon after, Asbury and I married. Let me tell you about my stepchildren. Susan, Eliza, oh, what a pretty girl. What a smart girl. She loved poetry. She loved to write it. She loved to read it. She even had a book of her own poetry published. She married O.P. Eldred. Some of you may know her grandson, George, who was an attorney here in town for many years. They tell me he was very, very good. Susan Delilah was a supporter of the Confederacy, and she was a founding member of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, Tom Johnson chapter, which is still alive today in Princeton. The son, let me tell you about him. His name was Asbury Jr., but we called him Barry. Now, Barry, Barry was an unusual boy. He was an unusual boy from the time he was a little boy. He was an independent thinker. He had a mind of his own. He was smart. He was interested in lots of things. He went off to college, hated it, came back home. At 18, he couldn't stand it anymore. And his daddy gave him money, and he went west. Go west, young man. And he did. And he went to California, and he became involved in land speculation. He was instrumental in founding San Francisco. He was involved in mining. He made his fortune in mining at a very young age. He continued to grow that fortune and to do things. And then in 1861, the war broke out. And I told you Barry was a Confederate supporter before the war even started. So when it broke out, he invested $2,000 of his own money and bought a schooner for San Francisco Bay. And they turned it into a pirate ship. And they were going to capture Union shipments of gold and equipment. And they were going to take that and use it or sell it for the Confederate cause. Well, Barry was captured. And he was tried for treason. And he was found guilty. And he was sentenced to 10 years in Alcatraz. Now, if Barry had depended upon his father, things might have been different. Many years before, Asbury Sr. had had a big legal case in New York, and his attorneys were Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, and I assure you that case turned out different. But Barry didn't depend on his daddy, but after a few months in that Yankee prison, he had a change of heart, and his dad became involved, and Barry was pardoned. Now, he didn't stay in this very same area, but he stayed in the area. And he continued to be involved in mining and in land and in banking. And again, he made more and more and more money. He married, he had three children, and he was doing very well. And then he invested money in a big diamond mine. These awful, awful, dishonest men salted an area with diamonds and good men like Barry invested in it only to find out that it was salted and it wasn't worth anything. Now some people want to say that Barry was involved in that and that he was part of that but he was not. I'm his stepmother. I would not. He was not. He was tried. They found him nothing. They investigated him. They found nothing. You know just over and over. But it played hard on him. And he and his wife decided to move back here. So in 1823, Barry, his wife, and his three kids came back to Princeton. We were so excited. We were so excited. Asbury gave him a thousand acres to start his life here, down on Eddy Creek. Have y'all ever heard of the Harpendine House? Yes. Well, that's the house that Barry built. 
That house cost him $100,000 back then. That's about $4 million mm -hmm. in your time frame. It had gas lights and heat. It had running water. It had flushing toilets first in this area. It even had bathtubs. And the grounds, oh, they were so pretty. He had fountains and fish ponds. He even had a greenhouse because he liked grapes year-round. It was wonderful. But he wasn't happy here. People were jealous of him. Remember, he left here as a boy and came home very, very wealthy. And people are mean sometimes. But he stayed. But being a country gentleman just really wasn't for him. And he liked that city living. And then Asbury Sr. died, which really just knocked all of our socks off. It really messed with us. And then a very, very tragic thing occurred. Barry's two little boys died of the influenza. Barry had them embalmed and encased in little glass caskets. And they kept them in an upstairs bedroom. Barry believed in the second coming of Jesus. And he wanted those little boys to be ready to ascend when Jesus came. Now rumors of that got out, and people talked, and they made it hard. So Barry and his wife decided to leave here. And he, his wife, those two little caskets, and his daughter, left here on a train. Now some people say they disappeared and left the house completely furnished. Well, that's true, because he sold the house and the furnishings to his sister. And they went to New York where he became involved in real estate and in the stock market. And he continued to do very well. Wherever he went and whatever he did, he made money. Maybe not friends and maybe not good feelings, but he made money. In 1923, Barry died in New York, but not before he wrote a book. And that book was called The Great Diamond Hopes. And in that book, he told what really happened, and he talked about his innocence. Well, we got the book here. He was there. He died and was buried up there. I want to tell you something. As his stepmother, I want you to know he was a good man. He wasn't involved in that awful diamond hoax. He wasn't crazy. He was independent. He thought for himself. He did what he wanted to do, but he paid his own way. He didn't depend on anybody else to do it. And I thought he was special. And I want you to know that he was special too. You know, I died in 1833, and I'm buried here with my husband. Eddie. Hi, my name is George Shelby Creekman, and I'm eight years old. Uh, I have a mother. I have five siblings: uh, Verdi and Annie and Herschel and Ruth and. Poor old Shelly. <laughs> my mother's name is Lola and my father's name is George. Shelly thought that he was smarter than me, but I knew way more than he did. And I was bigger too, and I made sure he knew it. That last day, it was me and Daddy and Shelly, and we were loading tobacco wagons at the Steger Tobacco Factory. And um, Daddy promised me that we were going to go fishing later that day, as soon as we got done with loading the tobacco. So I just, uh, decided as they were taking their break that I'd just keep on loading tobacco and that we'd get to go fishing faster. So that's what I did. And I loaded three or four wagons and about that fifth wagon of tobacco, I didn't touch anything but the electric elevator doors started to close on me. Mm -hmm. Shelly ran over there to me and tried to keep the doors up but he just wasn't strong enough. The last thing I remember were his bloody hands, his bloodshot eyes, and his sweaty face. A bead of sweat rolled down into my eyes. The elevator door snapped me in half, and the doctors tried to nurse me back to health and put me back together, but I was too far gone. I survived through the night, but died the next morning. They took me up here, had a huge procession, lots of flowers. It was beautiful. Mommy used to come up here and cry just about every day. And Daddy came up here too. I thought they were going to make themselves sick. 
Daddy used to apologize how we didn't get to go fishing. I wish I could go fishing just one last time. And bubble gum. Hmm. I haven't had a piece of bubble gum since 1923. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks for visiting. Howdy, how y'all doing? My name is Dan Grogan. Now, I wasn't born in Caldwell County, but I got here just as fast as I could. A fine place to live. Uh, I was actually born in North Carolina, and uh, I, uh, me and a bunch of my friends, Civil War came along, and we decided we'd join up, and we were going to do what they call see the elephant. Huh. That elephant's a fearsome, powerful thing. You really don't want to see it any more than you could help. We'd seen it plenty. We was uh, retreating back from a little old battle y'all might have heard of, I don't know, called Gettysburg. Uh, anyway, we, a bunch of us was captured. And we got sent to this little prison camp called Fort Delaware. And about the time you, we would have thought, and you would have thought, that things just couldn't get worse, they sent us to another one. It's called Point Lookout. Terrible, awful place. We survived, and we, we went on back home. But by the time I got home to North Carolina, there just wasn't much for me there anymore. So uh, I drifted west and just to see you know, what I could see and find and arrived here in Caldwell County and I met a woman named Virginia Wright. And she certainly turned out to be the right one for me. We made a fine life. We had three, three wonderful girls, Susie, Ida, and Lizzie. Uh, Susie married a man named James Wiley. And uh, as I got a little bit older, I'd reached the ripe old age of 62. He used to like to try to tell me what to do and you know, he just thought I was a little slow, I guess. And Anyway, he had me harrow in a field and uh, uh, shoot, I was riding that harrow. I'd been told not to. I knew not to, but when you're 62, it's a long walk across them fields and at the end of the day, you just walk them out. So I would ride the thing. Well, and uh, you know, who could say that an accident was going to happen? You don't ever know. Uh, accident's all it was. Big puff of wind come up and blew my hat off. Well, it's my favorite hat. What would you do? You'd reach and try to get your hat, too, and try to catch it. Well, it turned out to be a mistake that I did that. And so I ended up, I fell in front of the, the harrow, and I was dragged until the horses reached the end of the field. Only thing that stopped them was the fence. So that's the story of how I ended up right over yonder. But my story goes on because I have kin folks, same as your stories will go on, and same as the ones that came before. I have been here so long and get so bored. My name is Evelyn Groom, and I have been here since 1911. I was seven years old when I died. My mom and daddy were George and Willie Groom. Daddy owned a nice grocery in Princeton, and I was their only child. Dr. Pollard found out that I had a brain tumor when I was six. For a whole year, Mom and Daddy knew I was going to die. But back then, they just couldn't operate. After they buried me here, they ordered a marble angel all the way from Italy. Two different times. The mean boys turned it over and knocked off the head, arms, and wings. I don't know why they have to be so mean. But some of you may remember my Mom and Daddy. Mama didn't die until 1961, and Daddy was the oldest member of First Baptist Church when he died in 1965. All those years apart. Oh, but I'm so glad you all stopped by. Jesus loves me. Sully McGoogan. Mr. McGoogan was married to his wife Maddie. They had six children. Mr. McGoogan was a teacher in the all-black school at the time. He was born January in 1870, and at that time he was there was a school, more like a two-story house building, where the Dodson Park is located nowadays. That's where I'm assuming that the school was before the Dodson High School came. And he taught school. 
he didn't say exactly how many years, but then he went on to become a principal. And then after that, he went on to become a professor. They had six children. And out of his six children, I know that two of them, they said, became a professor like their dad. So in order to send his kids to school to become a well, become successful like he was, he had to take on another job. He became a poster carrier. And I think his route was out in the Farmersville area at the time. They said Leech Hill. So on a Saturday morning, from what I understand, that he was out picking up mail, delivering mail. And for some reason, his vehicle had started to roll. And he went to try to retrieve it. And he came up with the worst end of it. He fell onto the running board, and somehow it ran over and injured him seriously. Yeah. And at the time, he was living out on the Wilson Warehouse Road. And eventually, I guess at the time, they didn't think about taking you to the hospital before they took you home. I'm just assuming. So they took him home, and then they took him to the hospital over at uh, Hopkinsville. And it wasn't Jenny Stewart at the time. I want to say they said it was named by Mercy Hospital. And so there he died of his injuries from the vehicle accident. So thank you very much, and you all have a good evening. I'm Myra Kelly, and my husband Marshall and I, oh, we still have some more coming, I see. Didn't want to leave you all out. As I said, I'm Mar Myra Kelly, and my husband Marshall Kelly and I, we live right back here by this tree with six of our children. I'm going to tell you about a very, very sad thing that happened to the Kelly family almost 100 years ago. It'll be 100 years in November that we lost six of our, then we had 10 children, we lost six of 10 children. I don't know if you ever heard of the influenza epidemic of 1918, but it was a horrible, horrible time. It started over in Europe somewhere, I think, and went all around the world. We heard at the end that they said there was over 50 million deaths because of it. Well, that's a lot of people. Well, it came here to the United States and made its way to Princeton. And they were closing schools and churches and picture houses and any kind of public meeting place trying to keep people from catching this. It didn't work for us. Marshall and I were tenant farmers for Mr. J.R. Kevill. And our, our second oldest boy, Eddie, he was 16. He would help his daddy out on the farm. He came, one, came in one evening in early November, 1918, and he was, he was not feeling well. He was sick. He was running a fever and chills, just sickening over something. So we started nursing on him. And the next day, his brother Charlie got it. So the doctor came in and he said it looked like we had the flu. So he gave us some tonics and told us a few things we could do, but it didn't work. Two days after Eddie got sick, he died. Two days after that, Charlie didn't make it. Now Charlie was our jokester. He's the one who liked to laugh and cut up and, and tease his daddy and me. He used to drive his daddy crazy. That week, he wasn't laughing anymore. Right after that, 11-year-old Laura, who has just the prettiest voice, she stopped singing. I got sick. Nursing my kids, I caught the flu. My two older girls, Birdie and Mary, had to take over nursing and dealing with the house and the cooking and everything. And then our four-year-old boy, Laurie, who absolutely worshipped Charlie. He just followed his big brother Charlie around everywhere. Well, he got sick too. And he followed Charlie. But the worst thing was my baby. I killed my baby. I should have sent her away. I should have let somebody else take care of her, but I didn't. And I gave her the flu. And she died. And I was so sick I couldn't bury my baby. 
Marshall and Mr. Uh, Kettle had to take care of that for me. Luckily, there weren't any more. The rest of the children were okay. They didn't get it. And I got better. I got over it. And we started putting our house back together and trying to go on. And two months later, our oldest boy, Omer, he was 20, getting ready to start his own life. He got meningitis. They said it was from the flu. So that flu killed six of my children. And there wasn't a thing we could do about it. They didn't have vaccines back then. But when they started having vaccines, I made sure my grandchildren were getting them. And my other kids were getting them. Because nobody should do that. Nobody should lose that many of their family in one week. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, say, to end this on such a sad note when you're out taking a walk on such a lovely evening. So I'm just going to say thank you for all for stopping by. And if you're up this way, come by and say hi to us. We're always here. Thank you. Well, good evening, folks. How y'all doing? Ain't it kind of nice when you die that your family builds a little house up on top of the hill? <laughs> so you can see the big house over there where you used to live. Yeah, Edsmore is right over there, just beyond those trees. I'm John Osborne, and I was married to Selena Smith, Miss Catherine Garrett's aunt. And I was born in New York, got my education there, became a doctor, moved out west to Wyoming, went to work for the railroad as a surgeon for them. In 1907, I was on a tour with some uh, other doctors. We were touring the world on, on a boat. And I ran into Miss Selena Smith, and I was infatuated with that young lady. She, there was just something about her, and I, I was so, so taken with her that I told my other doctors that I was going to join her group, and I'll meet them back in the States when it was all over, because they were touring pretty much the same place we were on the same ship and all. So when the tour was all over, we got back to the States. I made several trips from Wyoming to Princeton, I guess you say courting her. Long way to court, wasn't it? <laughs> well, I did ask her to marry her, marry me, and uh, she told the family we had to understand that we were going to get married. Her family was shocked. The whole town was shocked because I was 30 years older than her. But like I said, I was in fact with anybody by that young woman. She really struck me off my feet. Well, we got married in 1907 that summer. Had the house all decorated. Colors that she chose for the wedding were yellow and white, but the curtains were all drawn in the house. Couldn't see outside. They had that for a purpose. They wanted to show off the new electricity that they just had the house wired. Wanted everybody see the new electric light bulbs that were hanging in there. That's how the wedding was, was done, inside with the light bulbs. Well, we had a wonderful marriage, one child, and I died in 1943. Got a little house on the hill. Well, the story that I haven't told you was that in 1878, out in Wyoming, <clears throat> there was a man by the name of Big Nose George Parrott, and he was an outlaw, robbing trains, stagecoaches, banks, people coming down the road. He even robbed a train I was on one time and made me late for a party. <laughs> I didn't forget that either. Well, he robbed a train one day, and they caught him and brought him to Rollins, Wyoming, and had a trial. He said he was guilty, then he said he wasn't guilty, he was guilty, he wasn't guilty. The jury found him guilty, sending him to hang. Well, the crowd, the town people didn't want to wait any longer, so they, they went to the jail and got him out of the jail, and they were going to lynch him. And he's in leg irons, and the first rope they used broke. Then they got another rope, put the noose around his neck, had him on, on standing up on a kerosene barrel, and he was telling them to shoot him. He was done suffering enough. And that didn't work. He fell off of it and didn't kill him. So they got him on a ladder, <laughs> threw the rope over the cross arm on a tele telegraph pole, and hung him from there. Well, he was kicking and screaming, hollering from the shoot me, shoot me, shoot me. And sometime during that case, before he died, the noose slipped off and pulled his ears off. <laughs> Well, there was no family there to claim the body. The other doctor and I, we were there for the purpose to make sure he was dead. He was dead. <laughs> so we took the body for 
scientific purposes. That's what he said. That's not what I took it for. He took it. He took the brain and the, and the skull and did studies on that. I skinned him. I took the skin off his chest and off his thighs, and I made me a doctor's bag and a pair of shoes. I even wore those shoes in 1893 when I was inaugurated as the third governor of Wyoming. Wore the shoes while I was president of the bank there in Rollins, Wyoming. In fact, I don't have the shoes on tonight because they're in the museum in Rollins, Wyoming, along with a death mask of Big Nose George without any ears. So if you're ever out that way, stop in and see. You'll see somebody from uh, a relationship, you might say, a kin, an acquaintance from Princeton there. So I appreciate y'all stopping by tonight, and one of these days you might get your little house on the hill, something like that. Tonight. Thank you, good night. Well, it is my distinct pleasure that on behalf of the City of Princeton, the Caldwell County Genealogy Society, and the Caldwell County Historical Association to announce to you that a section of the cemetery has been designated by the Kentucky Historical Society as a pioneer cemetery. Now you have just heard some of the rich stories of our citizens and along with those wonderful stories and the fact that we have people buried here who were in Kentucky before 1800 and that 10% of the people in the section designated died before 1850 gave us the necessary documentation to be named a Pioneer Cemetery. I would like to share with you three stories that we came across as we were documenting for the Pioneer Cemetery. The first is of Margaret Edwards, who was born in Maryland in 1788 and died in Caldwell County in 1850. Now, Margaret's father was one of the signers at the Maryland legislature to ratify the Constitution. 
But the thing that's unique about Margaret is that she was an independent woman. When she died, her will states that she left her estate to her niece and her great niece because she did not want women to be beholding to men. The second story is that of Alexander Howard, who was born in 1810 in Charleston, South Carolina. We know that he shows on the 1840 census as a barber, and we believe because of that that he is the first African American to have a business in Princeton. The third person is Dr. James Throckmorton, and I'm sure many of you have seen his gravestone. It's the unique pagodas as you come into the cemetery. Dr. Throckmorton was born in Virginia in 1785 and died in Caldwell County in 1848. He was not only the physician in town, but he also owned a drugstore. And one of the unique things about that was that you could get smallpox vaccinations there. Join us sometime in 2021 when we dedicate the Pioneer Cemetery marker for Cedar Hill Cemetery. Yeah. You want to know something about the genealogy library? That's where we get the ideas for the ghost walk. Um, uh, most of the information will come from here. Uh, we have a large, a very nice genealogy library. Somebody said it was the the gym that uh, Princeton has that they don't, most people don't know about. Anyway, uh, we do have, we've had a lot of donations as far as books and maps and pictures and things, and we're always appreciative of that. And uh, I don't know, we just, I've been here 15 years and since we've opened here on the corner. And uh, so I enjoy it. And we just, we have lots of things here. People need to come down and see what all we have.